Liebe Teilnehmer und Teilnehmerinnen, danke, dass ihr hier seid. Willkommen zu dem Abschlussvortrag des 31. Heidelberger Symposiums. Kurz vorweg. Kurz vorweg, nach der Videokonferenz wollen wir hier das Symposium zusammen abschließen. Ich bitte euch deshalb schon jetzt einmal danach noch sitzen zu bleiben. Wir halten es kurz. Herr Chomsky ist bereits mit uns verbunden. Moderiert wird die, Podiums, äh, die Videokonferenz von Aristoteles Akridopoulos. Herr Akridopoulos studierte Sozialwissenschaften, Philosophie, Geschichte und Erziehungswissenschaften an der Uni Siegen. Seit 2016 ist er wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter von Prof. Dr. Axel Honneth am Institut für Sozialforschung in Frankfurt. Dort forscht er auch aktuell zu intellektueller Gesellschaftskritik sowie Krisen- und Schulddiskursen innerhalb der Eurokrise. Seit 2018 ist er wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter am Lehrstuhl für moderne politische Theorie von Prof. Dr. Michael Haus an der Uni Heidelberg. Hier absolviert er derzeit auch seine Diss Dissertation zu dem Thema Dissens, Autonomie, Praxis zu Lehrstellen und Potenzialen radikaldemokratischer politischer Bildung. Seine Forschungsschwerpunkte sind politische Theorie, Gesellschaftskritik, poststrukturalistische Diskurstheorien, politische Diskursanalysen sowie Hegemonie- und Populismustheorien. Er ist zudem publizistisch und journalistisch aktiv. Zuletzt interviewte er für die Zeitschrift Hohe Luft den Philosophen und Literaturwissenschaftler Josef Vogel. Herr Akridopoulos wird nun kurz in den intellektuellen Werdegang Noam Chomskys und sein politisches Denken, Denken einführen. Es folgen ein Vortrag von Seiten Herr Chomskys sowie ein interaktiver Teil zwischen den beiden. Hinterher wird dem Publikum die Möglichkeit gegeben, Fragen zu stellen. Kurz zu den Fragen. Wir haben hier in der Mitte ein Mikro aufgestellt. Das ist nicht direkt mit Herrn Chomsky verbunden. Herr Akridopoulos wird die Fragen wiederholen und bei Bedarf übersetzen. Herr Akridopoulos, vielen Dank für Ihr Kommen. Dear Mr. Chomsky, it's an extraordinary honor to have you as a patron. Thank you for the time to speak with us. We're looking forward to the next 90 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you. We're all familiar with the uh, famous doomsday clock established by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, right after the, uh, uh, the use of the atomic bombs in 1945. Uh, it uh, has a minute hand, which is set uh, a sorry, few Mr. minutes. Sorry, Mr. Chomsky, sorry to interrupt you. I have, oh, now, you the inter I have now the oh, introduction oh, in German. You're, so yeah. you have to wait, please, five minutes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Sehr geehrtes Publikum, sehr geehrte <coughs> Gäste, ich heiße Sie alle herzlich willkommen zum Abschlussvortrag von Professor Norman Chomsky, der die Schirmherrschaft des diesjährigen 31. Heidelberger Symposiums innehat. Als erstes möchte ich mich herzlich für die Einladung bei dem Organisationsteam der Studierenden bedanken. Für mich als Nachwuchswissenschaftler der Politik und Sozialwissenschaft ist es eine große Ehre, diese Veranstaltung mit Noam Chomsky und mit Ihnen allen hier moderieren zu dürfen. Ein Intellektueller zu sein, schreibt Chomsky, ist eine Berufung für jeden. Es bedeutet, den eigenen Verstand zu gebrauchen, um Angelegenheiten voranzubringen, die für die Menschheit wichtig sind. Ende des Zitats. Der Linguist, Philosoph und politische Intellektuelle Noam Chomsky gehört zu den einflussreichsten Wissenschaftlerinnen und Persönlichkeiten der Menschheitsgeschichte. Er hat über 100 Monographien verfasst, zahlreiche Auszeichnungen, Gastprofessuren und Ehrendoktorwürden erhalten. Nach seinem Studium der Linguistik und Philosophie in Philadelphia und Harvard wurde er 1955 in Philadelphia in der Stadt, wo er am 7. Dezember 1928 zur Welt kam, in der Linguistik promoviert. 1961 wurde Chomsky Professor für Linguistik und Philosophie am renommierten MIT in Cambridge bei Boston. Er blieb dem Institut für über 50 Jahre treu, lehrte und forschte dort mit seinem Team zur theoretischen Linguistik. Durch seine neuartigen Syntaxtheorien, die in den 1950er und 60er Jahren entstanden sind und oft mit dem Oberbegriff der generativen Transformationsgrammatik oder später Universalgrammatik zusammengefasst werden, hat Chomsky nicht nur die Sprachwissenschaften revolutioniert 
und er wird infolgedessen in eine Reihe mit Denkerinnen wie Galilei, Descartes, Newton, Humboldt oder Einstein genannt, sondern er hat auch mit seinen Erkenntnissen, die Kognitionswissenschaften, die Computerlinguistik, die Informatik als auch die Erkenntnistheorie und Psychologie maßgeblich beeinflusst. Er stellte die These auf, dass jeder Mensch, egal wo er auf dieser Erde lebt, mit angeborenen kognitiven Tiefenstrukturen ausgestattet ist. Der menschliche Geist ist damit mit einer Sprach- und Grammatikkompetenz, die mit einer kreativen und innovativen Freiheit als auch mit einem moralischen Gerechtigkeitsempfinden versehen. Mit seinem Protest gegen den Vietnamkrieg begann in den 1960er Jahren sein politisches Engagement als öffentlicher Intellektueller. 1964, um genau zu sein, nimmt somit Chomskys andere Leidenschaft neben der Sprachwissenschaft und der Philosophie ihren Anfang, sein politischer Aktivismus. Chomsky wird zu einer der wichtigsten Stimmen gegen den Vietnamkrieg der USA und zu einer zentralen Leitfigur der amerikanischen Antikriegsbewegung und des sozialen Protests für Frieden. 1967 erscheint sein berühmter Essay »Die Verantwortlichkeit der Intellektuellen« in den New York Review of Books. Zitat, die Intellektuellen, so Chomsky, haben die Verantwortung, die Wahrheit zu sagen und Lügen aufzudecken. Die Intellektuellen sind in der Lage, die Lügen der Regierungen zu entlarven und Handlungen nach ihren Ursachen, Motiven und bisweilen verborgenen Absichten zu analysieren. Zitat Ende. Diesem Ideal ist Chomsky bis heute treu geblieben. Den amerikanischen und europäischen Akademikerinnen, Schriftstellern und sonstigen intellektuellen Figuren hat er im weiteren Verlauf seines Lebens mehrmals konformistisches Verhalten und Verantwortungslosigkeit vorgeworfen, weil sie sich nicht gegen die Verbrechen ihrer Regierungen zu Wort gemeldet haben. Chomsky ist aber auch einer der bedeutendsten Kritiker des globalen Kapitalismus, das für ihn ein unfreies, unmenschliches und umweltzerstörerisches Herrschaftssystem darstellt. Tief mit dieser Kapitalismuskritik ist auch seine Imperialismuskritik an den westlichen Staaten, allen voran der US-amerikanischen Kriegspolitik nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg verbunden. Chomsky weist in seinen zahlreichen politischen Analysen nach, wie viele Kriegsverbrechen, Menschen- und Völkerrechtsverletzungen von den regierenden politischen und ökonomischen Eliten seines Staates und ihrer Verbündeten, aber auch von anderen globalen Großmächten durchgeführt, durchgeführt, durchgeführt wurden und weiterhin werden. In den letzten Jahren hat Chomsky sein Augenmerk vor allem auf die globale Umweltzerstörung und den Klimawandel sowie auf die Millionen von Menschen, die sich auf der Flucht befinden, gerichtet. Dass die gemeinsamen Ressourcen unserer Welt in den Händen von einigen wenigen liegen, ist für Chomsky das zentrale Hindernis, welches eine freie und emanzipatorische Entwicklung der Menschheit und der anderen Lebewesen auf diesem Planeten verunmöglicht. Die Konzentration von Reichtum und Macht, die durch neoliberale und autoritäre Politiken in den letzten Jahrzehnten enorm zugenommen hat und die mit einem gleichzeitigen Abbau von zivilgesellschaftlichen, erkämpften demokratischen und sozialen Rechten einhergeht, zeugt für ihn, dass der politökonomische Machtmissbrauch der herrschenden Klassen immer mehr ausartet und uns alle in den Abgrund der Selbstauslöschung führt. Chomsky ist selbst Befürworter des libertären Sozialismus oder auch Anarcho-Syndikalismus. In seinem auf sehr berühmt gewordenen Aufeinandertreffen mit Michel Foucault im niederländischen Fernsehen im Jahr 1971 sagte Chomsky Folgendes über die Ziele seiner politischen Ideale. Zitat, wenn meine Annahme stimmt, dass ein Grundelement der menschlichen Natur das Bedürfnis nach schöpferischer Arbeit, kreativer Forschung und freier Kreativität ohne den willkürlichen einschränkenden Einfluss von aufgezwungenen Institutionen ist, dann folgt daraus natürlich, dass eine würdige Gesellschaft die Möglichkeiten zur Verwirklichung dieser fundamentalen menschlichen Eigenschaft maximieren sollte. Jede Form von Zwang, Unterdrückung, 
autokratischer Kontrolle von Lebensbereichen, wie sie privates Kapitaleigentum oder die staatliche Kontrolle darstellen, all diese autokratischen Restriktionen für beliebige Bereiche des menschlichen Strebens sind zu überwinden zugunsten von direkter Partizipation in Form von Arbeiterinnenräten und anderen freien Zusammenschlüssen, die von Individuum gegründet werden, um dem gesellschaftlichen Leben und der produktiven Arbeit zu dienen. Anarchosyndikalismus besteht für mich aus einem föderierten, dezentralisierten System freier Vereinigung, das sowohl die Wirtschaft als auch andere gesellschaftliche Institutionen umfasst. Ende des Zitats. Chomsky ist ein Denker der Gerechtigkeit, der an die radikale Gleichheit und Freiheit aller Menschen glaubt und sich für die Unterdrückten und Leidenden einsetzt. Er hat weiterhin die Hoffnungen an die den Menschen innewohnenden Möglichkeiten der kollektiven Emanzipation und an eine Welt des friedlichen und nachhaltigen Zusammenlebens. Aber dafür, dafür müssen wir mit zivilem Ungehorsam gegen die, wie Chomsky sagt, Herren der Menschheit aufstehen. Von Chomskys Leidenschaft zur radikalen demokratischen Selbstbefragung und Selbstkritik und allen voran dem Mut zur Wahrheit können wir einiges lernen. Wir, die zu den Privilegiertesten auf dieser Erde zählen und mit unseren Lebensweisen auf Kosten anderer leben, während diese anderen vor allem im globalen Süden gleichzeitig flüchten, hungern, ertrinken, getötet oder in Lagern eingesperrt werden. Es gibt leider zu wenige unabhängige, kritische und zugleich bescheidene intellektuelle Persönlichkeiten wie Noam Chomsky. Er ist vor kurzem 90 Jahre alt geworden und er erhebt weiterhin seine Stimme gegen das unzählige Unrecht auf dieser Welt. Noam Chomsky wird uns nun in seinem Vortrag seine Diagnosen des gegenwärtigen Weltzustandes präsentieren. Seit 2017 lehrt und forscht er als Professor im Department of Linguistics an der University of Arizona in Tucson, nahe der Grenze zu Mexiko. Liebe Gäste, bitte begrüßen Sie herzlich live zugeschaltet aus Tucson, Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by going back to a grim day in August 1945, uh, August 6th, uh, the day in which uh, humans uh, demonstrated that human intelligence had uh, achieved the means to destroy all life on Earth. Uh, the capacity wasn't there yet, but it was obvious that it would be soon developed. Uh, shortly after that, the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, a major group of atomic scientists, established uh, their uh, famous uh, doomsday clock. Now, the clock has uh, uh, a minute hand, which is a certain distance from midnight. Uh, midnight means terminal disaster. Uh, at the beginning, it was set at seven minutes to midnight. Uh, it, uh, uh, in 1953, uh, the United States, then the Soviet Union, uh, explo exploded uh, thermonuclear weapons. Uh, that really did demonstrate the capacity for total destruction and the minute hand was moved to two minutes to midnight. Uh, since then, it has oscillated, uh, depending on circumstances. Uh, a few years ago, a new uh, danger was added to the calculations, uh, namely the threat of environmental catastrophe, and the clock was moved to three minutes to midnight. Uh, the latest as soon as Trump was, President Trump was elected, moved a half a minute closer to midnight uh, last January, the most recent setting. It was put again at two minutes to midnight, the closest it's been to terminal disaster since 1945. Uh, this, 
the uh, scientists and political analysts who set the clock described this as the new abnormal. Uh, they gave uh, uh, dire warnings uh, and uh, they added uh, last January a new consideration to uh, the nuclear threat and uh, environmental uh, deterioration, namely the uh, undermining and uh, collapse of democracy through the world. That's the third danger, major danger. And that uh, makes a good deal of sense. I'll return to that. I'd like to say a few words about each of these threats. Uh, and uh, let's begin with the fate of the environment. Uh, just a uh, few weeks ago, uh, we learned that uh, the uh, ice sheets in the West Antarctic, which contain a colossal amount of water, are melting five times faster than in the 1990s when the Kyoto Agreement was reached. At that time, the ice sheets were stable. Uh, now they are thinning, about a quarter of them are thinning. In fact, uh, more than uh, 100 meters are low, have been lost in some places, huge amount of water. Furthermore, the current losses are doubling every decade. Uh, the effects on the sea level will, of course, be catastrophic if this continues. Uh, we should bear in mind that the uh, 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 heating of the earth has, is beginning to approach the level of 125,000 years ago, at which point the sea level was about six to nine meters uh, higher than it is today. Uh, melting of the polar ice caps could uh, easily carry us over the brink. Uh, there are, I don't have to comment on what the effect would be of sea level rise of that, of that uh, character. And uh, those who read the science journals are aware that uh, ever more ominous reports uh, appear quite regularly. Well, the Trump administration has uh, offered its own assessment about what's happening. It uh, recently released a long 500-page uh, uh, environmental impact assessment. Uh, the uh, study concluded, this was the point of it, concluded that uh, we should cancel all emissions regulations for cars and trucks. And they had a sound argument. Uh, the argument was we're going off the cliff anyway, and uh, emissions regulations on cars and trucks don't make all that much difference. So why bother? Uh, their assumption is that uh, by the end of the century, the uh, a temperature will have risen uh, four degrees centigrade. Uh, those of you who've followed these issues know that that means uh, essentially the end of organized human life on Earth. Uh, there is another assumption in their analysis, uh, namely that uh, everyone in the world is as criminally insane as we are and will do nothing about it. Well, I don't like hyperbole, but I think it's fair to say that this must be uh, the most uh, evil document in human history. And it passed with essentially no comment. Uh, the crucial point uh, here is uh, that uh, the, they know exactly what they're doing when they race to escalate the use of fossil fuels, which of course the US is doing. It is now the rogue state in the international arena in this respect. Uh, there's a good deal more evidence about that. So the president, President Trump, uh, happens to be on his way to Ireland in a few days. Uh, he's going to uh, uh, stay at his, he's having a vacation there. He will stay at his golf course in Ireland. Uh, a couple of years ago, he appealed to the government of Ireland 
for permission to build a sea a wall to protect the golf course from the rising sea levels uh, caused by global warming. Again, a, a demonstration that uh, uh, he and his associates knew exactly what they're doing. Uh, go back to the Republican primaries in 2016. It was quite a remarkable uh, event in some respects, which were not discussed. Uh, every single candidate in the primaries uh, either denied that global warming is taking place or with uh, two exceptions uh, said, yes, maybe it is, but we shouldn't do anything about it. Uh, the most uh, respected of the candidates, uh, John Kasich, uh, uh, governor of Ohio, um, he uh, said, yes, of course, global warming is taking place, but uh, in Ohio, we're going to use, we're going to continue to use our coal and we're not going to apologize for it. Uh, he was the most respected and in many ways the most uh, immoral of the lot. Uh, let's turn to the uh, major banks. Uh, the biggest bank in the United States, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, has a chief executive CEO, Jamie Dimon, intelligent man, knows as much about global warming and its effects as any of us. Uh, he is pouring more and more money into the use of fossil f investments, into the use of sane, intelligent human beings be consciously trying to escalate what they know very well is total disaster, uh, the end of organized human life on Earth. And if you think about it, you can see the answers. So take Jamie Dimon again, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, he has uh, several choices. One choice is to do exactly what he's doing, to accelerate the race to disaster. Now, the other choice is to resign and be replaced by someone else who will do exactly the same thing. Uh, the point is that these are not uh, individual crimes, they are institutional crimes, which are not easy to overcome. Now, we have many examples of that. Uh, take the uh, major uh, energy producer uh, in the United, in the United Energy Corporation, uh, ExxonMobil. Uh, ExxonMobil scientists were in the lead in the 1960s, 1970s in uh, assessing the impact of global warming and uh, warning of its uh, dire effects. In uh, 1988, uh, James Hansen, leading climate scientist, uh, went public with a famous speech in which he warned that unless drastic measures are taken quickly, uh, the human species will face real total disaster. In that year, 1988, the executives of ExxonMobil began, who had all of the uh, information from their own scientists sitting on their desks, uh, they began a large-scale program to deny that global warming is happening, or at least to sow doubts among the population as to what it's happening. Uh, that's a pretty remarkable fact. As soon as they found that it was going to be public, they, they said they started propaganda campaign to try to undermine concern about it. Well, uh, these uh, examples can be multiplied. There is, of course, an impact on the population. You take the uh, governing Republican Party in the United States, look at polls about uh, attitudes of Republicans. About 25% of Republicans think that global warming is a 
serious problem, problem we have to hurry to address. Uh, there are studies of uh, how people rank the various issues that are of concern to them. Among moderate Republicans, the sensible ones, uh, global warming is ranked about 25th in the list, uh, well below such uh, colossal issues as uh, alleged uh, uh, Russian interference in the election. When you go to conservative Republicans, it's even lower, about 30th in the list. Uh, this is, uh, uh, why, why is this the case? Uh, partly it is the effect of the denialism. Uh, when the uh, political leadership and the uh, uh, corporate, uh, corporate world with its uh, massive propaganda, uh, when they uh, tell the population there isn't much to worry about, then, of course, people respond. Uh, the media, for a long time, uh, didn't really cover the issue very much at all. That's improved somewhat. But when it's covered, it meets the condition that uh, you can't show bias. So you have to present both sides. You have to give equal time to the uh, 97, 98% of scientists who say, uh, we're heading for disaster, and to the scattering of people who say, well, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, there, uh, you f If you read the business press, you regularly find euphoric accounts of how new technology is uh, opening uh, ways to greatly enhance uh, oil production. Uh, new fields are being opened. In fact, it's all propelled the United States uh, back to its earlier position of the uh, leading producer of the substances that will devastate human society. Uh, recently, the United States even surpassed Saudi Arabia. Uh, the writers of these articles occasionally mention some effects on uh, some negative effects of these developments. Uh, for it might harm uh, ranchers in uh, uh, the West, who will, whose water supplies will be affected by fracking. These long articles proceed without a word on the effect on the environment. Uh, and there's a reason for that too. It's called objectivity. If you go to, German, uh, to journalism school, you're taught that you have to be objective. And objective means describe accurately what is being discussed in the corridors of power. Uh, if they're not talking about global warming, which they are not, don't report it. Uh, if you were to say something about it, that would be a departure from objectivity. It would be showing your bias, so you can't do it. Well, the result of all of this is tremendous ignorance, uh, which is a path to disaster. Uh, uh, let's turn to the second threat that is uh, led to the setting of the doomsday clock as close to midnight as it's ever been, uh, the threat of nuclear war. Uh, there has been some progress in reducing the threat. Uh, there are three major arms treaties, uh, each of which uh, uh, lessened the threat, not sufficiently, but uh, substantively. Uh, one is the uh, ABM Treaty, uh, ban uh, restricting uh, 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 anti-ballistic missiles. Uh, the second is the uh, INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Forces, uh, reached by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987, which uh, has uh, reduced the uh, short-term uh, nuclear missiles in Europe, which were highly threatening. The third is the New START Treaty, which reduced, uh, in which both Russia and the United States uh, substantially reduced their uh, nuclear forces. Well, the ABM Treaty was abrogated by President Bush in 2002. 
the INF Treaty has just been uh, abrogated by President Trump. Uh, Putin followed shortly uh, uh, behind. The uh, uh, status of the new START Treaty has to be renewed in 2020. Status is very dubious. That means that all three of the treaties uh, will have uh, collapsed. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, the new uh, a nuclear posture review of the Trump administration that calls for developing uh, uh, highly dangerous uh, new weapons. It calls for a strategy of uh, that would enable the United States to prevail in a war against China and Russia simultaneously. Uh, every one of those planners knows perfectly well that even engaging in a war with either of them would mean complete terminal disaster. It's understood that uh, even a first strike would destroy the country that uh, uh, set off that first strike simply by the effects of nuclear winter. Uh, but so it continues. The Russians are doing the same, also uh, uh, escalating their nuclear forces. Meanwhile, there are serious tensions at the Russian border. Well, just a couple of days ago, a report came out, which I'll quote, uh, Russia and America are taking turns probing each other's airspace. And she points out that the Russian bombers and fighters remained in international airspace, and at no time did the aircraft enter United States or Canadian sovereign airspace. But it added that U.S. forces are conducting similar operations near Russian airspace. Uh, the U.S. Air Force in March 2019 deployed B-52 bombers, uh, the major nuclear capable bombers, to the uh, United Kingdom. And some of these B-52s flew mock nuclear attacks on Russian soil. B-52s, nuclear capable, flying mock nuclear attacks on Russian soil. Well, that brings up memories. Brings up memories uh, of uh, the early days of the Reagan administration. Uh, when the Reagan administration came into office, it uh, decided to test Russian air defenses. Uh, and the way it did it was by uh, simulating attacks on Russia, air, land, sea attacks, including nuclear attacks. Uh, this was called Operation Able Archer. Uh, the assumption was, well, the Russians wouldn't, would realize that we're not planning an attack, so it's pretty safe. Uh, now that the Russian archives have been released, it turns out that, not surprisingly, they were taking this very seriously. This was a time of extreme tension in uh, Europe, as you may recall. Uh, Pershing missiles were being installed in, uh, in uh, Europe, which could uh, have a flight time of uh, uh, 10 minutes to Moscow, no time to react. And at this point, uh, the US was simulating attacks, which uh, uh, in, uh, in which included nuclear attacks. Well, current intelligence analyses point out that we came very close to war at that time. Uh, how close is worth considering? At one point, uh, the uh, Russian uh, detection systems, which are pretty primitive as compared to the American ones, and doubtless have many errors, uh, they uh, provided inform they uh, received information that a large-scale missile attack was coming from the United States uh, to uh, destroy uh, Russia. Uh, the protocol is for that information to go to a particular individual. Uh, his name was Vladimir Petrov. Uh, he is supposed to transmit it to the high command, uh, then to the uh, the Politburo chief, and they respond, they 
decide whether to respond with a retaliatory attack. Uh, Vladimir Petrov decided not to transmit the message. That's why we're alive today, literally. Uh, it's not the only case. There are several other cases. But the point is that if you look over the record of the nuclear age, it's an absolute miracle that we've survived this long. And miracles don't persist. Uh, the sword of Damocles is uh, uh, dangling over our heads, and it's uh, uh, suspended by a very thin hair. Uh, notice that uh, these tensions are taking place at the Russian border, uh, not at the Mexican border. In fact, that would be unimaginable if uh, there was any threat anywhere near the United States we would already have a final war. Uh, why is it happening at the Russian border? Well, the answer, of course, is NATO expansion. Uh, go back to uh, 1990, 1991, when the Soviet Union was collapsing. There were negotiations. Uh, uh, George Bush, the first President Bush, uh, the German Chancellor, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, they uh, had uh, different visions of what the post-Cold War world should be. Uh, Gorbachev's vision, which he advanced, was for a, a European, a Eurasian security zone, a joint security zone with no uh, military alliances. Of course, the Warsaw Pact was being dissolved. Uh, the West uh, had a different picture. They wanted to retain NATO, the uh, military alliance of the West. Uh, the big issue at the time was Germany. Uh, should Germany be unified and permitted to join NATO? Well, for the Russians, for Gorbachev, that's quite a concession. I uh, don't have to recall to you that uh, Germany alone uh, virtually destroyed Russia uh, several times in the preceding century. Uh, nevertheless, Gorbachev did agree to have a unified Germany rejoin NATO, but with a quid pro quo. Uh, the condition was uh, presented to him both by the United States and the German statesmen was that, there would, that NATO would not move one inch to the east. That was the phrase that was used. That meant East Germany. No one was contemplating anything beyond. Well, the agreement was reached. NATO immediately moved to East Germany, uh, forces in East Germany. Uh, when Gorbachev objected, it was pointed out to him that this was only a verbal agreement. Nothing was on paper, so it was fine. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton then became president, expanded NATO through the uh, East European satellites. Uh, in uh, 2008, there was even an offer to Ukraine to join NATO. That's the Russian geopolitical heartland. It was reiterated in 2013. Uh, George Kennan and other senior statesmen had warned early on, right at the beginning, that this NATO expansion was a tragic mistake, in Kennan's words, a policy error of historic proportions, since it would plainly soon lead to tensions, severe tensions, at the Russian border. And in fact, so it has, and the risk of nuclear war is not slight. One of the prominent uh, European historians in, in England, Richard Sakwa, uh, points out that, as he puts it, NATO's mission today is to manage the risks created by its existence, which is in fact correct. Uh, that's not the only flashpoint that could easily lead to nuclear war, which recall is terminal war, uh, but it's the most important of them. Well, uh, let me put that aside and turn to the third challenge to survival that moved the doomsday clock to as close to midnight as it's ever been. 
namely the deterioration of democracy. And as I mentioned, that makes, makes good sense to include this as a third threat to survival. Now, the reason is that the sole hope for decent survival is that an informed public will take the lead in confronting the lethal challenges that humanity faces. Uh, organized, committed, popular action has been the critical factor in driving uh, such uh, progress as it has made. So for example, the INF Treaty, 1987, was reached after huge public protests and demonstrations uh, in the United States and in Europe. And uh, that remains the hope for today. Well, what are the prospects? Actually, they're mixed. There are some positive signs. So the militant actions of uh, Extinction Rebellion, recently the school strikes, uh, have dramatized the uh, extreme dangers that we face in the near future from uh, uh, global warming. Uh, in the United States, uh, Sunrise Movement, which is actually a small group of young people, uh, were able to mount a series of actions, including occupying congressional offices. Uh, these uh, succeeded in putting an ambish, ambitious the Green New Deal program on the electoral agenda. Now, that's a necessity for survival in one or another form. Uh, outside the United States, uh, national governments are doing at least something, not enough, but something. And the same is true of states and localities within the United States, though crucially not the federal government, which is racing in the other direction, alone in the world. Now, there is a long way to go, and there's not much time. And in this context, the uh, quite notable uh, decline of democracy around the world is a very serious issue, in some cases with quite significant implications for survival. But the most important example, of course, is the United States, uh, the most powerful country in world history with uh, incomparable advantages. And now alone and swinging the wrecking ball under the lead of a narcissistic megalomaniac who also happens to be a very skilled politician who is brilliantly exploiting uh, and uh, contributing to the sharp deterioration of democracy. Say more about that later. Uh, no less dangerous is what just happened in Brazil. Uh, there, the newly elected president, who is one of the most uh, grotesque of the brutes who is, are now disfiguring the world stage, uh, he has pledged to accelerate the destruction of the Amazon what is called the lungs of the earth, the major carbon sink of the earth. Uh, this in order to, uh, uh, as a gift to his uh, friends in agribusiness and the mining industry. Uh, that uh, means virtual genocide for the indigenous population and a very severe blow to avert for uh, hopes for averting uh, environmental catastrophe. And uh, here, too, his rise to power uh, reflects a very sharp deterioration of democracy in the major country of the Western Hemisphere outside the United States. Uh, it, uh, his campaign uh, was based and success was based, relied on flooding, huge flood of social media with uh, vicious lies and defamation. Uh, these are operations which appear to trace back to the United States. Uh, they are a portent of what's likely in the upcoming elections in the United States and elsewhere. 
on the eve of the election, the most popular figure in Brazil, uh, Lula da Silva, former president, uh, who was way ahead in the polls, uh, he was silenced by sending him to prison on very dubious charges, uh, placed in solitary confinement, uh, and crucially banned from making any public statesman, statement, which could have shifted the election radically. Uh, this is uh, the culmination of a soft coup that's been underway for several years uh, to try to reverse the uh, significant uh, progress that was made under the Lula da Silva government, a golden decade in Brazil's history, the World Bank concluded in a detailed study. Uh, Lula is in fact uh, the most important political prisoner in the world today. The one would know almost nothing about this from the media. A further comment on deterioration of democracy. Uh, throughout much of the world, a reactionary wave is undermining hopes for healthy democracy. Uh, while the circumstances vary, there are some basic shared reasons, especially through the domains that have been subjected to the neoliberal assault of the past generation. It suffices to heed the words of Thomas Piketty and his colleagues write that an economy that fails to deliver growth for half of the people for an entire generation is bound to generate discontent with the status quo and a rejection of establishment politics. The effects are of course enhanced when economic growth has concentrated extraordinary wealth and a tiny fraction of the population. And corporate profits are skyrocketing. Meanwhile, real wages are stagnating, social benefits undermine. In the United States, real wages uh, for male workers are about what they were in the 1960s. These effects are enhanced still further by the very harmful effect on functioning democracy which is a direct consequence of sharp concentration of wealth, corporate power in Europe, uh, driven even further by the transfer of essential decision-making to the unelected Troika with the Northern banks, especially the German banks, uh, looking over their shoulders. Uh, in the United States, there's a long history of bought elections. Uh, it's remarkable, but uh, with remarkable precision, one can uh, predict electability for president and Congress uh, simply by looking at campaign spending. That's true right through the 2016 election. Uh, legislators spend uh, many hours a day uh, just uh, approaching donors in preparation for the next election. Uh, meanwhile, Swarms of lobbyists meet with the staff to write legislation uh, with pretty obvious consequences. Uh, these practices have rapidly escalated during the neoliberal years uh, with the help of the most reactionary Supreme Court in living memory. And the result is that a large part of the population, a large majority in fact, are literally disenfranchised in that there is no relation between their preferences and attitudes and the uh, decisions made by their own representatives who are listening to other voices, the voices of the donor class. Uh, the most recent studies, actually just reviewed in the business press a few days ago, give a very graphic picture of what's happened to the general population during the neoliberal years. Now, the figures are astonishing. Uh, the top 0.1% of taxpayers control 20% of American wealth. 
the top 1% control 40%. The bottom 90% have only 26%. The bottom half of Americans have a negative net worth. That means their debts exceed their wealth. Uh, meanwhile, the multinational corporations move almost half of their foreign profits into tax havens, lower tax jurisdictions. The huge sums are stolen from the population by tax avoidance. These same studies found, I'm now quoting the business press, that something cataclysmic happened around 1980. As Ronald Reagan was winning the White House in 1980, the top 0.1% controlled 7% of the nation's wealth. By 2014, after a few decades of booming markets, stagnant wages, the top 0.1% had tripled its share to 22%. That's more wealth than the bottom 85% of the country. Uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, while middle-class Americans were burdened by job losses and debt, the rich had swiftly resumed their party. The wealth that had vanished from financial markets after the collapse had reappeared, the doubling and tripling the portfolios of well-off investors uh, uh, like uh, agribusiness and fossil fuel production, the financial institutions, which now pretty much dominate the economy, uh, benefit from enormous taxpayer subsidies. That's not just the regular bailouts, which make the headlines, but for, far more important, uh, what is in fact a tacit government insurance policy, assurance that if the banks fail, the taxpayer will bail them out. Now that provides them with uh, high credit ratings, inflated credit ratings, uh, uh, cheap uh, access to cheap credit, uh, numerous other advantages. Uh, that amounts to practically their entire profits, according to IMF studies. In the uh, great growth years of the 50s and 60s, uh, the banks were regulated by New Deal measures. There were no crashes. Uh, the banks also served the real economy. Under Reagan and his successors, uh, deregulation has led to repeated crises, uh, each one worse than the last. And the institutions are increasingly divorced from the real economy in fact, uh, harming it in many ways. If you take a look at, uh, say, Apple, uh, other major corporations, increasingly they're devoting their resources to highly profitable financial manipulations instead of to uh, research and development and uh, product and development. Uh, they're relying on the tacit government insurance policy uh, to just in case things go wrong, the taxpayer will come to the rescue. Uh, the general population face not only stagnation and decline of benefits, but also insecurity. Uh, they're becoming what is sometimes called a new precariat. Uh, the former uh, Federal Reserve Chair, Alan Greenspan, attributed his success in running the economy uh, to what he called greater worker insecurity. And what he meant, said is that workers are so intimidated that they won't seek better wages, better working conditions, that increases profits, controls inflation, uh, since it's a healthy economy by some standards. Well, people who are cast aside by social and economic policies and foresee a bleak future, quite naturally feel resentment, uh, anger, fear, and it's all too easy for such feelings to be transmuted into a search for scapegoats 
uh, commonly those who are even more vulnerable. That's particularly true among populations that have been atomized by policies designed to undermine the social order, uh, guarded, guided by uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, maxim that there is no society, uh, only individuals. That's actually her unwitting paraphrase of Karl Marx, who bitterly condemned the authoritarian rulers of Europe for seeking to turn society into a sack of potatoes, in his phrase, an amorphous mass of isolated people who concentrate, who confront concentrated power alone. That a crisis of democracy should result from this is not very surprising. And in fact, in election after election in Europe, the centrist parties have been collapsing their similarities in the United States, even though the parties retain their names. But the outcomes are often attributed to xenophobia, uh, fear of immigrants, uh, racism, uh, other social pathologies. But there's a good bit of research that shows that the basic problem is economic distress, stagnation, uh, insecurity, along with the undermining of social policies, all of which does open the door to pathological symptoms that can be exploited by demagogues for ugly ends. It's important to recognize that from the perspective of the framers of neoliberal global capitalism, the resulting deterioration of democracy is a very positive feature of the policies. Uh, the essential guiding principle was expressed very well in 1969 by well-known Austrian-American economist uh, Fritz Machlup, who's a prominent figure in the neoliberal movement that uh, took shape in Vienna after World War I and finally achieved hegemonic status with uh, uh, Thatcher and Reagan. Uh, Machlup urged that uh, we should reflect, I'm quoting him, reflect on the proposition that full democracy, full democracy may not be the most suitable system for government for politically and intellectually immature people. The unlimited right to vote and elect the men who will govern the country may lead to the destruction of many other freedoms and of any chance for economic development. Uh, the other freedoms are the sanctity of investor and property rights, including free movement of capital, uh, unhampered by sovereignty, by unions, uh, by other impediments to uh, what's called the optimal use of resources. It's a very convenient euphemism, which easily transmutes into luxury yachts for the rich and uh, bags of potato chips to the rest. Well, without continuing, the challenges we face are formidable. They can be confronted, they can be overcome, but in the light of their severity, a delay is not an option. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Chomsky. You can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Sorry, Mr. Chomsky, for our technician. Can you say something again, please? Do uh, you want you want to check the sound? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So um. Okay, perfect. You, we can hear you. Questions and discussion. Yeah. 
Thank you very much again, Mr. Chomsky, for your very uh, inspiring lecture and for your diagnosis of our global conditions. So I will start now with my questions and open then the floor to the audience. My first question uh, is that you mentioned all these threats of our um, current situation, global situations, and we know that there, that we are on close to midnight, what you say. You mentioned the clock. And so my question is, our capitalist way of life, above all the destruction, growth, imperative, uh, it's a key uh, problem of our system. We have the destructive economic system, the extreme pollution that destroys the planet, the biodiversity, the future generation, and above all, us, humankind. So how can we make this very unjust world that we human beings uh, made, which is probably at the crossroads, to a better one? What, what you would suggest for us, how we can get out of this amazing problems that we are facing? Well, just uh, think again of, say, one example that I mentioned of the major banks in the United States, and in fact, elsewhere, where the uh, chief executives understand perfectly well the effect of fossil fuel production, the dire effect, and are pouring money into uh, increasing the flood of fossil fuels. And as I mentioned, they have two choices, to do what they're doing or to resign, in which case somebody else will do what they're doing. That is an institutional problem. It's a problem of the nature of the capitalist institutions, the duty, in fact, the legal responsibility of the CEO is to increase profits and market share. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you do about that? Uh, what you have to do is dismantle the institutions, but then we run into a problem, a problem of time scale. The time scale of dealing with the dire threat of environmental catastrophe and the time scale of dismantling institutions just don't match. It's a necessity to solve the problem within the framework of existing institutions, while at the same time proceeding to lay the basis for a much better world. Uh, the, uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting, to, uh, and it can be done. Um, there are serious, careful proposals uh, Maybe the most detailed one is by uh, economist uh, Robert Pollan, a leftist economist at uh, uh, the University of Massachusetts. He has a very detailed, sensible, highly worked out plan for how you could, with even contemporary technology, uh, overcome, keep the global warming within some livable amount if not 1.5 centigrade, maybe a little beyond, uh, even within existing institutions. Uh, at the same time, it's also worth bearing in mind that the institutions are very fragile. In fact, if you look at debate going on in the United States right now, you can, and I'm the same elsewhere, you can see how close we are to a radical transformation of institutions. So for example, take a huge debate going on right now, all over the world, prominently in the United States, all over the newspapers. Uh, how can we prevent China from stealing jobs from industrial workers? Well, it's interesting the way the debate is framed. Is it China that's stealing the jobs? I mean, is China putting a gun to the heads of uh, General Motors, uh, General Electric, uh, 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 Microsoft, IBM, and saying, you've got to send your jobs here? No, of course not. It's the management of those uh, 
of those corporations that's deciding to do it. So what's the solution? To take the, which is not raised, but it's right on the, at the edge of people's uh, thinking with a little push it can get there. Say, okay, since the problem is the management of the institutions, let's have a different kind of management, maybe a more democratic form of management. And maybe the people in the enterprise should make the decision as to where investment should go. Uh, that happens to be an idea that uh, was suggested by a rather obscure gentleman in the 19th century whose uh, initials were uh, KM, if anybody can remember. So yes, uh, maybe uh, we're right on the verge of saying, look, it's time for the people who work in the enterprise to make the decisions about what happens to it. And that's just on the cusp of a major radical transformation of institutions. I don't think that change of institutions is impossible. And we should remember that uh, if you go back to the early days of the Industrial Revolution, uh, say in the United States, same in England earlier, uh, the working people, say about in the mid 19th century, the working people took it for granted that wage labor was an intolerable, illegitimate attack on their fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. That wage labor was essentially the same as slavery, except that it's temporary. Actually, that was a slogan of the Republican Party in the mid 19th century. It was upheld by Abraham Lincoln. It's a major uh, principle of classical liberalism going back to John Locke, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, John Stuart Mill, others. Uh, it's been suppressed, but I don't think it's far below the surface. And just as the question of uh, decision-making over enterprises is not far below the surface. So to summarize, I think there are feasible measures to deal with the dire problem even within existing institutions that will take a lot of activism, mobilization, the work of the kind that Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement, others have demonstrated recently. But at the same time, the change of, the radical change of institutions is not as remote a prospect as sometimes believed. It's sometimes claimed that it's uh, easier to think of the end of the world than of the end of capitalism. But I don't believe that. I think it's uh, easy to think of it. And in fact, I think people are coming very close to the realization uh, that they can do something about it. So I, when I just um, summarize you, the, the major radical transformation that we need, so the social and ecological transformation to, to secure our human being and the uh, earth, so it is not possible. So you have a very, very pessimistic view that we cannot change the institutions because they are really oligarchical structured between political elites and economic elites. But on the other side, you are also an optimist because you are saying, okay, we have the social protest, we have the civil disobedience, we have the opportunity in our societies to go out to the streets, to go in front of parliaments and to try to, to have this radical change. But I just want to say that you have now, in your last sentence, you mentioned it, um, pessimistic view that we cannot change the parliamentary system and not also the parliamentary system. We know that big decisions are not made anymore it, in the parliament. So you said it, we have uh, multi-corporate World Bank, the ECB in Europe um, and the financial markets they are doing the decisions. So 
what you would answer now, uh, if I understand you right, understood you right, that it, it, you have a pessimistic view that we cannot change the institutions. Well, I, I, I really don't believe that. In fact, uh, let's think about it again. Uh, the major decisions are, of course, they're made by the World Bank and the IMF, but the driving force is uh, the, uh, uh, the corporate world, the concentration of power in huge mega corporations. Now, just, and here what is needed is not so much civil disobedience as simple education. Simply think how close people are to realizing that in fact they have to take control. Go through it again. China stealing our jobs. That's what's driven into people's heads every day. Uh, it's obvious that China is not stealing our jobs. No, it's the corporations that decide to move to China that are stealing our jobs. Who tells them to move to China? The management. Suppose that the working, the workforce of the enterprise democratically decides what should be done, not handing it over to the management. Suppose we even make a further move and eliminate the curse of wage labor and have democratic control. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a difficult argument? I think it's a pretty easy argument. I've just summarized it in a, a minute, you know, mm -hmm. that can easily be brought to people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's never mentioned. Uh, nobody says, look, the answer is not uh, China, the problem of China. The answer is something was suggested by Karl Marx in the mid-19th century and of working people at the same time. Uh, that's the answer. Uh, but it, uh, I don't think it takes a lot for people to get to understand that. Mm -hmm. It's never presented to them. Mm -hmm. You take a look at the entire discussion of uh, job loss and the uh, effects that it has, the uh, pathologies that are being stimulated by people like Trump and others. Uh, it's simply that nobody is telling people, look, stop to think for a minute. Uh, if you think for a minute, you can figure this out. It doesn't even take a high school education. It's transparent. Mm -hmm. So along with militant action, which is very important, like Extinction Rebellion and so on, school strike, I think simple educational efforts uh, can make an enormous difference in undermining highly repressive institutions, which are fundamentally illegitimate and should be dismantled. And there are ways to do it. Now, the time scales may not coincide exactly, but you can accelerate both of them. There are many opportunities for action. It's easy to be pessimistic, but uh, I think we should remember uh, the slogan that uh, Gramsci made famous, uh, uh, pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. Thank you very much for uh, this question. So, the, uh, for this answer, so, so the education you said is a really important uh, tool to change our society and also to to change our economy. So, our destroying economy that is destroying us and our planet. My next question is on the number that we have. Um, but the high number that we have now in the world, the highest number of refugees. So in the current world, the UN um, HCR, it's calling that we have 70 million people um, that are refugees, others are speaking of 100 million people. At the same time, uh, global social inequality and poverty are growing in many regions. You also mentioned it in your talk and even in Western societies, we have increasing social divide, divide that has deepened since the financial crisis a decade ago. So isn't it the only consistent solution, Mr. Chomsky, to 
institutionalized global freedom of movement so that people can live their lives wherever they want. It is, uh, it's kind of like saying uh, uh, in an era of wars and violence, uh, the solution is peace on earth and goodwill to men. Mm. You know, that's true, but it uh, doesn't get us very far. Uh, take, say, the Schengen Agreement, mm. which did institute something like that on uh, within Europe. Uh, very positive development, I think. Uh, but uh, take a look at uh, the consequences. In an era, it's, uh, it, uh, it's, as you know, of course, under very severe attack everywhere but not because it was a bad idea, because it is against the background of neoliberal austerity policies, which have severely harmed the lives of a large part of the population, leading them to search for scapegoats and being led by demagogues who drive them to scapegoats. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, blaming the policies that the social and economic policies of the neoliberal era, era, the easiest thing is to blame immigrants. Uh, they're not responsible for it, but they're the victim. The easiest thing is to blame somebody more vulnerable than you. And the role of the demagogue is to drive that uh, pathology. But the role of the activist is to undermine the pathology and to direct attention to what the real causes are. And if you ad address those causes, the objection to, say, the Schengen Agreement would dissolve. And it's more general. Uh, the uh, Pope uh, Francis pointed out, I think, quite accurately, that the uh, crisis of refugees is not a refugee crisis. It's a moral crisis for the West. Uh, the idea that uh, Europe is sending back uh, uh, tens of thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands dying in the Mediterranean, uh, bribing Turkey to keep them away from our shores, bribing Libya to you know, keep them there. You know, uh, This is so shocking that I can't even describe it. Same in the United States. Uh, not far from, I live not far from the southern border. Mexican border, uh, the idea that uh, miserable people are being uh, taken, separated from their children uh, who are put in concentration camps, uh, put in solitary confinement, uh, driven back uh, to uh, countries uh, which have been, which are unlivable, is utterly shocking. And it becomes even more shocking when we realize that the hideous conditions from which people are fleeing uh, did not just come as an act from God. Uh, Europe has a certain history in Africa, which I don't have to relate. Uh, the United States, even in recent years, has devastated Central America. Uh, people are fleeing right now from the uh, Mayan highlands in Guatemala, where Ronald Reagan was supporting virtual genocide uh, not long ago. Those countries were devastated by the United States. Now we punish the victims. Uh, all of this is a horrendous moral crisis. Uh, it, uh, and it can be overcome, but first by understanding it and recognizing what it is. Uh, not only should refugees be dealt with humanely, but we should also understand that they don't want to be refugees. Almost always they'd prefer to be in their own countries if they were, if that was possible and that can be overcome. Instead of destroying their countries, we could be rebuilding them. If we were honest, we would call it reparations. If we're not that honest, we can call it aid or something. But uh, all of that can be done. So these are all policies well within range. And we should bear in mind that what's called the refugee crisis today is nothing as compared with what's going to happen in another few decades. Uh, simply calculate the consequences of a rise in sea level 
on, say, the uh, low-lying plains of Bangladesh, mm -hmm. and you can, uh, or the effect of uh, uh, a, a good bit of uh, South Asia is now facing a water crisis already and almost unlivable heat during the summer. That's uh, hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going to happen to them if uh, the uh, West Antarctic uh, uh, ice sheets uh, continue to melt or even accelerate? It doesn't take much imagination to figure it out. There'll be a refugee crisis of a kind that is absolutely unimaginable. And uh, the solution is not dealing with refugees, but ending the crisis. Just as the solution in Europe is not tearing apart the Schengen Agreement, but undermining the social and economic policies that have allowed demagogic leaders to direct fear and anger at vulnerable people as scapegoats and away from the actual source of their distress. Thank you for your answer. I will come to my um, third question. Even in our privileged societies, you mentioned before, uh, neoliberal policies are leading more and more people into precariousness. So neoconservatism can be seen as the back of the, this neoliberal model. Women are the ones who suffer most in this current world, and care and reproduction work and cheap labor continue to be carried out by women. Violence against women continues also to be high in many parts of this world, including our Western societies. So in the last years, we saw some important phenomena. So I will mention uh, five million women in Spain went out for a successful general strike on um, March 8. Um, also in India, you have a lot of young female students last year protested for more self-determination rights, autonomy against sexual violence, against patriarchy. So how do you think, what do you think, Mr. Chomsky, about these new feminist movements? Well, that's uh, half of human society, which uh, throughout most of history has been uh, severely repressed, uh, placed in a secondary position of subordination. That's a, that's a major uh, a stain on uh, the human history, not everywhere, but overwhelmingly, finally being addressed seriously. It's been a long struggle. Uh, go but take, say, again, uh, England and the United States, the, which were in the most, in many ways, the most advanced uh, in freedom and democracy. Uh, in the United States, uh, at the time of the American Revolution, the women were not recognized as people. They were property under British law, which was taken over. You look at Blackstone's compendium of British law that bases uh, women are property. A woman is the property of her father. Property is handed over to the husband. Uh, one of the arguments against allowing women to vote at the Constitutional Convention in the United States was that it would be unfair for two unmarried men because a married man would have two votes, uh, his own and his properties. Uh, that remained in the law until 1975, literally. It was as a result of the activism of the 60s, including much of it led by women, the beginning of the women's movement, that finally the Supreme Court decided in 1975 that women uh, have the rights of peers. They have the right to serve in federal juries. They're exact, they're legally peers. Well, that's a formal advance, but it's been accompanied by many others. Now, there's a long way to go, but the uh, things that you mentioned, which also take place in the third world, a huge women's march in, uh, uh, in, in Brazil, for example, which I discussed uh, shortly before the election, there was a huge uh, 
demonstrations in all cities of uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, led by women against the uh, uh, terrible um, sexist uh, uh, gangster who uh, was elected by uh, this massive social media campaign, mostly women. And that's, uh, these are very uh, salutary, very uh, positive developments. Again, there's a long way to go, plenty of problems, but uh, it's the kind of thing that should uh, gain uh, enormous support and uh, uh, commitment. So I will move now to my last question and then open the floor for the audience. Um, my last question is, we have now these really, really big problems that we have after the world financial crisis of 2007, uh, but also you mentioned in the 80s and 90s with Reagan and Thatcher, the neoliberal paradigma, there is no alternative deregulation, dismantling of basic social rights, privatiza privatization, econ economization of our lives, of everything, of our soul, of our flesh. Capitalism is in us and everywhere. So these measures um, have been implemented to a large extent by centrist parties. So social democratic parties or conservative parties. So the mass centrist uh, people's parties. Now they, pre they present themselves as good parties that oppose the new right-wing ultra-nationalistic ultra authoritarian regressive forces that you also mentioned are an international movement. We have Bolsonaro, Trump, Orban, Erdogan, the Brexiteers, um, a lot of um, uh, people um, that are supporting these regressive forces. So for the plural left, and I know that you are coming from the left, from the libertarian socialist, uh, anarcho-syndicalist movement, um, which itself has been now for the plural left all over the world in a crisis for decades. What can be a solution? So in Germany and also in France and in other parts in Europe, we are talking, should leftists focus on the state and uh, should um, support left-wing populism that should uh, lead back to a socialist or social democratic Keynesian policies of the golden years? Or, or should we have to change the world in an international, transnational solidarity movement with many emancipatory forces can join against capitalism, oppression, and a nation, a nation state. Well, I think. So, uh, yeah. So the, well, the options are not only worth pursuing, but are being pursued. So uh, take the, uh, the European, the parliamentary, the European Parliament elections. And there is uh, uh, the beginnings of a transnational. Uh, a, a political movement within Europe. The Yanis uh, uh, the Varoufakis' uh, DiEM25 movement, it's beginning, it's facing major obstacles, uh, many efforts to block it, it hasn't gotten to, uh, more, I think, more than uh, seven or eight countries by now. But it, and it, uh, Varoufakis and Bernie Sanders in the United States uh, uh, issued an important uh, declaration calling for a progressive international to confront the reactionary international that's being forged by Steve Bannon and others, including all the uh, lovely gentlemen you mentioned uh, before. Uh, the, that can be done, but it's not just a matter of politics, as we've been discussing. This depends a lot uh, in fact, crucially, on the nature of the social and economic institutions. They're the ones that have to be changed. They're the foundation on the basis of which these things are happening. The center-left parties can now 
pretend to be the good guys as opposed to the uh, far right, the neo-fascist right. Uh, but uh, that's a very thin claim, since exactly as you pointed out, it's their neoliberal austerity policies that have led to the rise of the far right. Yes, when you have policies that uh, devastate people, that create uh, anger, resentment, uh, bitterness, uh, then you will get demagogues who will try to turn it to the far right but it's the policies that the centrist parties have been pursuing that is leading to this. And they're the ones who have to look in the mirror and say, look what we've been doing wrong. And the much more important than that, the uh, populations themselves have to come to understand why these things are happening, how much we can take control of ourselves if we choose to, up to the level of taking control of enterprises uh, on the part of their own uh, uh, workforce, the most uh, democratic possible and uh, answer. Uh, all of these things are possible. Uh, they, uh, it takes work, takes effort, plenty of barriers, but uh, there have been harder problems in the past. I mean, I'm old enough to remember uh, vividly the uh, dark clouds of uh, fascism spreading over Europe in the 1930s. Uh, gee, uh, if I can use and have a moment for an anecdote, the first article I wrote was uh, in February 1939, uh, after the fall of Barcelona. It was in an elementary school newspaper. I'm sure not a very great article, but I remember the way it started. Uh, started by saying that. Uh, Austria falls, the Anschluss, uh, Czechoslovakia falls, uh, Munich, uh, Toledo falls, major city in Spain now, Barcelona falls, fascism has spread over Spain, seems to be inexorable, spreading over all Europe, uh, it's obvious what it meant, I don't have to repeat that. Now, those were days of a darkness that uh, far exceeds what we're facing today. Uh, and it's not the only time in history when monstrous uh, crimes had to be faced, slavery, uh, many others. It's been done, can be done again. So, Mr. Chosky for being here. Well, I think in the first event and now in the last, and I think I have now a pretty clear idea of the problems, the injustices, and the challenges we have now in this world. But what I've been missing is uh, concrete solutions about what uh, we should do about it. You've been proposing some ideas, but on the institutional level, my question for you is, what can I do as an individual, as a student, um, do um, today? Should I go in the streets and protest more? Should I go reading more books and studying? Or um, another thing? Thanks. Well, I think it's very straightforward. There's no magic keys. We all know the answers. Uh, one thing that a young person can do is exactly what many young people are doing. And the, in fact, it's kind of striking that uh, in the lead of protest and concern, uh, arousing concern for environmental catastrophe, in the lead are young people, uh, students in schools, the school strike, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement. Uh, earth strike, which I didn't mention, others. Those are some of the things that can be done. But there's much more than that. People, uh, people's understanding has to be changed. Consciousness has to be changed. Uh, what's called uh, hegemonic common sense has to be undermined. That takes individual effort. It can start with things as simple as talking to your neighbors. Let's take, say, uh, real movements. How do they get started? 
Uh, take, say, uh, civil rights movement in the United States. Uh, it had uh, major effects. Not enough, but major effects. How did it start? Well, uh, in 1960, a uh, few students, black students, four black students, decided to sit in at a lunch counter in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, where blacks were not allowed to sit. Uh, they were immediately arrested and taken away. I could have ended it, except that uh, the next day some more black students came and sat there. Uh, pretty soon uh, some white students joined them. Uh, within a couple of months you had uh, freedom riders going through uh, the South, very dangerous incidentally. M many were killed trying to encourage uh, poor black farmers uh, to vote, something as simple as that. Well, ended up being huge demonstrations, uh, massive uh, demonstration in Washington. Uh, finally, uh, uh, significant legislations were passed. Uh, take the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. Vietnam War was the worst crime in the post-war period. It took a long time to get any objection to it. I can remember myself back in the early 60s when I was, when the war was being escal sharply escalated and nothing was being said about it. Uh, I, I was actually giving talks in the living rooms of neighbors or in a church with uh, four people there. Well, a lot of other people were doing it too. And pretty soon it uh, grew and you had uh, massive anti-war movement so strong that it prevented, we know from the Pentagon Papers, it prevented the U.S. government from sending more troops there in 1968. It blocked uh, a likely, uh, possible even use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's the way movements develop and grow. What can young people do? Exactly what they've done in the past to get these movements started. It was the same with the feminist movement. It's been the same with uh, any popular movement throughout history. So what can you do? Answer is just about anything. Uh, people like you are really quite privileged, otherwise you wouldn't be here, meaning you have lots of opportunities. Uh, it's never going to be easy. You know, it might be something as simple as uh, talking to a few people in a neighbor's living room, the way the anti-war movement got started. It might be something as simple as sitting in a lunch counter, might be something much bigger like the Extinction Rebellion or school strikes, but it's all available. Um, and the problems, when you think about the scale of the problems, you know, they look so overwhelming that you just give up. But when you think of how fragile these systems are, and they are fragile, as soon as you begin cutting away at their roots, they begin to erode and collapse and small efforts can easily be uh, uh, grow into uh, major, major developments. Um, we've been talking about the ecological threat as one of the big three threats. And I wanted to ask if you think that at this point it is necessary to take political measures to restrict population growth in order to facilitate a good future for the planet, or if we can even take this step, if it's ethically um, possible to take this step. Well, uh, uh, the problem in, say, Germany is not restricting population growth population is declining. Uh, and there's a reason. It's been, there's, uh, population growth is one of the major problems of the world for which we know a solution. Education of women. It's been demonstrated over and over in rich countries and poor countries that education of women leads very quickly to decline in fertility. Uh, so, it's the reason why in advanced countries, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, population is actually declining. 
Uh, and the same is true in poor areas. India, for example, there's a huge population growth with one exception, the state of Kerala, which was under uh, communist uh, leadership most of its uh, independence history. It's a very poor area, but it has very high educational levels. If you travel through India, which I've done, it's the one place where you see people uh, uh, sitting in, uh, you know, in front of a, a restaurant reading newspapers. Uh, literacy is very high, education is very high, uh, women's education is high, and that has led to a sharp decline in fertility. So it's not the kind of thing you have to do with a gun at people's heads. There's a simple solution. We've seen it happen and it should continue. And yes, we should, population should be controlled. And fortunately, there's a very humane way to do it, a way which should be pursued quite independently of the question of fertility, namely bringing women into the functioning society, uh, including edu basic education. I'd like, okay, it's on? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you something about what you said earlier about education, uh, namely that it's key to establish a public anti-capitalist movement. Um, but I think, th at least I see a bit of a paradox there because education in schools and university isn't going, not everyone can, can enjoy this. So the media is probably going to be key for this. But the problem with the media is that they are profiting, like corporate media is profiting under the capitalist system. So they won't be, they won't be actively helping the cause of furthering anti-capitalism. Um, <coughs> so I see a paradox there because the media, by educating the people about, um, about how to resist capitalism, they would essentially shoot themselves in their own leg. So how can we overcome this paradox? Between well, uh, two points. Okay. First of all, there are two observations, a minor one and a major one. The minor one, which is not insignificant, is that these uh, institutions are not immutable. The schools and the media can be changed. Okay. They're not given, they're not graven in stone. You know. The more important fact is that we don't have to rely on the institutions that exist. That has never been done. You work around them. Uh, take, say, again, the worst crime since the Second World War, the Vietnam War. Uh, the, as I said, there was a huge anti-war movement that developed, and it reached a very large part of the population not just the activists. So when the war ended in 1975, uh, polls showed, and they continued to show for many years, that about 70% of the population regarded the Vietnam War as not a mistake, but fundamentally wrong and immoral. Now think about that for a minute. Not a mistake, fundamentally wrong and immoral. What did you read in the media? What did you hear in the schools, in the universities? That it was a mistake. Not that it was fundamentally wrong and immoral. Uh, in fact, to this day, if you read uh, the intellectual journals, New York Review of Books, last issue, for example, talks about the Vietnam and Iraq War mistakes. It's not what the majority of the population thought. They recognize they're not mistakes. They're fundamentally wrong and immoral. How did that happen? Not by changing the media, not by changing the schools, but by activist organization that spread throughout the country and led to a change of understanding and consciousness. Okay? Same with the civil rights movement. Uh, they were not teaching in the schools that segregation uh, should be ended and that People, this people set of rights was done around it. 
Same with the feminist movement, and same with the abolitionist movement back in earlier in history, the same with the workers' organization. Schools weren't uh, teaching that people could form unions. They did it outside the schools and the media. We are not constrained and limited by the formal institutions that exist. They can be changed, but you can work around them exactly as has been done throughout history. We're not forging new paths. We're using the experiences that have been accumulated through the history of struggles. And on the basis of those, we know how to proceed further. And it's something that each individual can do in his or her own circles and environment. It's simply if we need a radical change of, of the institution university and the knowledge that we, the power with the knowledge that we have, like, kind of, yeah. So, so we us? need, okay. sorry, you're saying we need a radical change in the way uh, thinking and inquiry and discussion are carried out within the universities. I think that's true, but the universities are, with all of their flaws, are nevertheless among the, uh, the probably the most uh, open, free institutions that exist. There's a great deal that students can do within the university setting to change the, the way in which the universities function. It's a lot easier than uh, uh, being a worker in a steel plant uh, where you're literally under tight uh, totalitarian control. The universities, you have a high degree of freedom, not perfect by any means, but comparatively speaking, compared to anywhere else. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, you might ask yourself, why is it the case throughout history, even in recent years, that it's young people, people roughly of your age, who are at the forefront of uh, uh, agitating and organizing for social change. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, people of your age are at the freest moment of their lives. Uh, they're, they've got to the point where they're out of parental control. Uh, they're not yet at the stage where they have to try to figure out uh, how to put food on the table for a family under owner's conditions. They have a very high degree of freedom. And it shows that's been the center of activism traditionally. You take the cases I mentioned, black students sitting at a lunch, at a lunch counter. They couldn't have done that when they were 10 years old. No, they wouldn't have been able to do it when they were 40 years old. They could do it when they were students. The same with the women's movement, it began the same way. Uh, same with the, uh, the peace movement, started with teach-ins, uh, organizing by students. Uh, there are, I should recognize that you're at a period of life where you have unusual opportunities and, the inst and you happen to be at a university, which is one of the institutions that is the most, the easiest to influence and affect by simple, you know, not by uh, taking over the president's office, but simply by discussion, uh, uh, organization, uh, uh, forming groups, uh, setting up independent courses, which can be done in most universities. I mean, uh, throughout my own teaching career, uh, uh, much of it has been sent in courses that I taught on my own time uh, for undergraduates on issues just like these, uh, courses which were open to the community. I tried to arrange them in the evening so that working people could come as well. Uh, all of these things can be done. It, uh, you know, it's plenty of opportunities to be, it can be, uh, it takes a little imagination, a lot of work, but it's feasible. Thank you. Hello, so if ever in the near future we have to decide between um, democracy and taking action against climate change, so if we must decide um, to put 
power into the hands of a small group of people or to go down as a democracy, which path to choose and why? Is between the choice between putting authority in the hands of a small group of people and democracy. Is that the question? No, if uh, we need, if we come to a place where as a democracy we can't take action against climate change and we could decide to put power into the hands of a small group of people, um, should we rather put the power into the hands of a small group of people and take action against climate change, or should we rather go down in a democracy? No. If we put power in the hands of a small group of people, uh, they will pretty soon use, be using that power for their own benefit, not for the benefit of the population. Uh, we have um, so many examples of that that uh, uh, if uh, that it's not even necessary to just think of the history and think of the logic. Now, the only real hope is for the general population, uh, an informed general population, to take matters into their own hands through the democratic process, uh, through uh, uh, interchange, uh, deliberation, understanding, uh, uh, reaching solutions which they then proceed to uh, to implement. Uh, you may pick uh, representatives to carry out this or that uh, activity. They should always be under recall and control. Uh, that's the way significant popular, the constructive popular uh, social change takes place. Uh, if uh, uh, someone, uh, if you think someone can lead you uh, to paradise, uh, someone else can lead you out, right out of it. That's uh, the way the world works. So placing a hope in some a vanguard party, uh, central committee, uh, uh, technocratic elite, or whatever it's called, is uh, simply a prescription for uh, 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 real uh, disaster, as we've seen over and over again. As in the case of Bolsonaro, um, ultra-conservative um, leaders use religion as a driving force to move the uneducated masses into supporting their agendas. And I wanted to ask what the role of religion in this in this country is in maintaining the institutions and the people who are so detrimental for democracy, or in other cases, or in the case of Bolsonaro particularly, for the maintaining of our world, does it always have to be a role of the opium of the people? Or can it also be, uh, or can it be otherwise? Because, well, this is a very important issue in those countries, even if it is no longer such in the Western developed world. So what is the role of religion? Mm -hmm. it, actually, it uh, can be many different roles. And we've seen plenty of examples of this. Uh, take, say, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, for most of its history, ever since uh, the Emperor Constantine took over uh, Christianity as uh, the religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, it's been, as historian of Christianity, Hans Kung described it, Christianity, Christianity became the religion of the persecutors. But it doesn't have to be. Uh, Pope John the 23rd in Vatican II in 1962 uh, tried to change the church back to uh, the Gospels, which happened to have a radical pacifist uh, message. Uh, the, this is the beginning of what came to be called liberation theology, especially in Latin America, uh, bishops, uh, 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 priests uh, uh, took up the call for uh, the uh, preferential option for the poor, as it was called, began to organize uh, uh, priests, nuns, lay people, began to organize peasants 
in poor communities uh, to uh, base communities, they were called to try to think through the message of the radical pacifist message of the Gospels and uh, organize to take control of their own lives. Now that became a very powerful movement. And you don't read this in your textbooks, but what happened is the US government launched the war against the church, literally. It literally launched the war against the church. And it takes pride, and there were, that's why there was a long series of religious martyrs in Latin America, including uh, the Archbishop in uh, San Salvador, including uh, six leading uh, Jesuit intellectuals and who had their heads blown out by uh, forces armed and trained by the United States at the end of the decade of the 80s. It's all suppressed, but it happened. And in fact, the US Army takes credit for it. If you read the, uh, the uh, uh, advertising points of the School of the Americas, which trains Latin American officers, killers mostly, uh, one of its points is that the US Army helped defeat liberation theology, namely the effort to bring the church back to its radical pacifist origins. And it had a big effect, uh, liberation theology. And the, I mean, I remember in the 1980s, uh, there was a very amazing movement in the United States. You don't read much about social movements, it's too dangerous. But in the United States, for the first time in the history of imperialism in the 1980s, uh, people, in, uh, people in, were going to Central America to live with the victims, partially to try to help them and uh, to provide what protection is offered by a white face. They were coming from, many of them coming from evangelical Christian communities, from rural communities in uh, the Midwest and so on. I remember giving talks in churches in Midwest conservative uh, religious communities where people knew more about Central America than uh, in the universities because they were living and working there. Uh, that's another way in which religion can function or it can be the religion of the oppressors as it very commonly is. There's nothing inherent in it that decides which way it'll go. It's up to the people to make it go one way or the other, assuming you want to be involved in it at all. So, Mr. Chomsky, we reach to the end. Thank you very, very much for your time. Also, in the name of uh, the organization team of the students here at the University of Heidelberg. And we wish you all the best for the future and thank you for all your reflections and for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.